We're the, the legends, legends of the, of the stoop. stoop. We're here to advocate, stoop. educate, and inspire society. Stoop. Coming at you live from the south side. Welcome back to Legends of the Stoop. I am your host, Mike Pernice. Today's episode is brought to you by Follow the Trees, Ride the Vibe. Make sure to use our discount code, Stoop Legends, at checkout to receive discounts on all CBD products. Today, my guest stopping by the student virtually is none other than Josh Whiteside, Executive Director of the Education Partnership here in Pittsburgh. Josh, how are you doing this morning? Mike, I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Beautiful yeah. Friday morning here in the Berg. How are you doing? I'm doing great as well. Honestly, it's kind of reflected in the painting right behind you of Pittsburgh. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I actually, I hung this up for a... Uh, for a panel that I'm going to be on next week. And I feel like I couldn't have just my standard movie posters. <laughs> yeah. So I went with the Pittsburgh artwork. I'm loving it. Thanks. Thank I'm you. loving That's it. a strip district special. I think it was 15. <laughs> <laughs> Got it at the one boutique that if you wanted to get a return, it probably isn't there anymore, huh? No. So, Josh, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself to the audience, tell them a little bit about who you are, maybe give them a little bit of background information uh, before we move on and talking about TEP. Okay. Uh, my name is Josh Whiteside. I am the executive director of the Pittsburgh local nonprofit organization, The Education Partnership. Uh, and you're going to hear all about that today. The mission statement from a 10,000 foot view is we provide students and their teachers in low income schools with all the resources that they need for their education. Uh, me personally, I'm 34 years old. I'm a born and bred Pittsburgher. I grew up in the South Hills, uh, went to college up 79 in sunny Meadville, Pennsylvania at Allegheny College, go Gators. And then after, after graduation, I came promptly back to Pittsburgh, uh, to Mount Washington. I worked in insurance before I got into the nonprofit sector, uh, but I've been on Mount Washington ever since, renting for a number of years. And now this is where uh, my wife and I live with our Boston Terrier, who is sitting right next to me, making noises. So if you <laughs> hear her, that's Riesling. Well... Thank you, uh, and as, uh, as I'd like to point out too, in our conversations, um, that you do have a connection to a Pittsburgh legend uh, through your football experience. Ah, uh, yeah, my boy, Pat McAfee. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me and Pat, so I, I was the kicker, <clears throat> I was the kicker at Upper St. Clair High School, mm -hmm. and Pat was the kicker at Plum High School, and, uh, we had the same kicking coach, the two of us. Mark Schubert was his name. He kicked, uh, he won the national championship with Pitt in the 70s. He was a, he was uh -huh. a great straight on kicker. Uh, so me and Pat were Mark's students. So we kicked together all the time in high school. Yeah. Pat, now Pat was a year younger than me, but he also, uh, well, he was bigger than me and he kicked barefoot. But God is my witness. If you asked Mark Schubert today, who was a better kicker in high school? Josh Whiteside, for sure. Ooh. For sure. So, Pat, if you're, listening, <laughs> if you're listening, that's a challenge. I think we need to get you guys uh, round up and get a little kicking competition going. Maybe get some donations flying. I'm Maybe here. Get some, I'll be collecting bets on the sideline. I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Um, so, what have you learned – um, from like from a sports standpoint, what did you learn um, throughout your athletic career um, that has like actually kind of like helped you and where you are in life nowadays? Like you hear a lot of people talking about how football builds this sense of like teamwork, you know, leadership. Where have you? Um, what have you taken away from your sports endeavors? Yeah, that's an awesome question, Mike. Uh, so I think I I have two two really big takeaways uh, from playing sports. And arguably, they are 
two, two of the more meaningful things that I took away from my college education in total. Mm -hmm. um, so one is time management, you know, playing, playing a collegiate sport. It's just, it takes a lot of your time. It takes a lot of your time in practice, in, in warmups, in weight room, in meetings, in everything. It just takes a lot of time. Uh, and I think if, if you're going to be a, a good student and not go to school just for the sake of playing football, I think time management is key. And it's not, it's not something that I had when I started, but it's certainly something that I had by the time I left. So I'd say sports taught me good time management. And then I think uh, particularly in – in my position as place kicker, uh, that that taught me how to deal with pressure. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know which one is more important, time management or, or having to deal with pressure, but I used to say it all the time. If I had a game on a Saturday and I had a, like a big test on like Monday or Tuesday, mm -hmm. if I could handle the game, the test was a breeze. Yeah. You know, there was there was no pressure that could amount to, I don't know, the the pressure you put on yourself. I mean, I I think I put a lot of self pressure on myself, but uh, being in a team atmosphere and in understanding the team dynamic, and you know, just having people counting on you, that's that that what that comes out the other end is pressure. Right. Uh, and I think I think I learned a lot from kicking in terms of that. Now, how would you then say that those skills have transpired into where you are now as executive director of TEP? How would you say that your time management and uh, your ability to handle pressure has helped you build a team around you um, that has, one, you've basically eliminated your turnover rate, right? And so how would you say that these skills have transpired and allow you to build an effective team environment at TEP? Well... So I don't know if those two things are completely interrelated. You know, there's a lot of things that go into that go into employee satisfaction and retention, and that's it. We can get to that. We can get to that. Uh, but the, but your the first part of your question in terms of how do I implement those things in my work life? I think that that gets by that gets to the point of what I said. Probably the most valuable thing I learned in my college education was those two things. Not any right. economics course or not any uh, you know, game theory or biology, whatever. It was those two things. And it's because time management is critical. It's critical in um, not only structuring your day and making sure that you have enough time to get all your work done. But, but for me, it's like, it's a form of sanity. You know, it's the only way that I can structure my brain. Okay. I need to, I need to bring my uh, budgetary mind to this meeting. I need to bring my programmatic mind to this meeting, my HR mind to this meeting. Um, and I think having it, having your time structured uh, is the first step into getting your mind wrapped around the day, so to right. speak. And I actually, I keep two calendars. I keep my electronic calendar uh, for all my staff to see. So my staff can see where I am. Uh, I was going to say 24 hours a day, but that's not true. <laughs> my, my staff can see where I am most of the day. I mean, you, I, it, it's it's up there for everyone to see. So maybe that is something to do with retention in a weird way, but I wouldn't, I probably wouldn't look too far into that. Um, and then I have my personal calendar that actually, it's not my personal calendar, my work calendar, but it mirrors the electronic one. But if I write it down, Mike, then I remember it. And it's like, right. it's, a, it's a habit, it's a habit. Um, so yeah, I think, I think just being able to structure my day and make sure I have enough time to get all my work done, to get all my personal life done. It's a key to balance, key to balance. Okay. Um, and then managing pressure, that's, I mean, that there's just as much pressure in our personal lives as there is pressure in the work life. So I think that's just a, that's a good life skill. I mean, it manifests it in the workplace in terms of there's some serious there's some serious decisions that you have to make on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think um, a lot of people have, in, in me included, a lot of people have this defense mechanism of, of procrastination. Yeah. Uh, that if I can put it off, that makes it seem easier. I can worry about that later. But I think part of dealing with, 
working with pressure is just being able to recognize a situation, make a decision on it, be confident in your decision, and and move forward. Um, I think I think there's pressure. Again, most of the pressure I put on myself probably comes from myself, or most of the pressure on me probably comes from myself. Right. Uh, in that, you know, you just don't want to. You don't want to fail. It get, maybe it goes back to that team dynamic. You yeah. know, I, I I really believe in in leading from behind, and in that I I am the support structure for my staff. Mm-hmm. Um, and if and if I can do my job properly to support them. Right. And they, they're going to be happy. And I think there's a pressure that comes along with that in that, am I working with this person enough? Am I getting all the feedback? Do, am I, am I thinking of this in the way that they would think of this problem? Mm-hmm. You know, that's, that's all self-assigned pressure. Uh, what's funny is the other things I don't feel like are pressure are, um, some of the things you would typically equate to pressure, like, organizational performance and, and outcomes and I mean don't get me wrong I certainly think of those things as goals that I need to hit but that's not where my pressure comes from yeah. you know maybe it's one of the I grew up saying just do the best you can mm-hmm. you know, that was our mantra and I feel like if, if I'm doing the best I can I don't have to worry about the goals you know if I'm supporting my team properly and in, in managing that pressure mm-hmm. the goal the goals are going to be there and if they're not there then, then we can readjust, but I haven't found that to be the case. Um, you know, if you worry about the small things on the front end, you don't have to worry about the things on the back end. You know that they're going to be good. So, right. Well, it seems like you also have a lot of trust in your team as well, and I think that also helps alleviate those pressures when it comes to like hitting long-term goals, because it's like you know, if you're if you're able to manage so much, like not on a micro level, but giving people that ability to be themselves and be creative in the workplace I think and as long as you build a good rapport with them I think you you somehow like you inspire them to be a better version of themselves right and once everybody is on point and striving towards the same goal then it's like it's almost it's up to them to check themselves but as a leader too right somebody who's leading from behind it's important to point out when or when somebody might be lagging behind right and trust, I mean, I mean, trust is absolutely enormous. Not not only in the workplace and everywhere you go, trust is enormous. Mm-hmm. But one of the one of the things that I I see the most value in in keeping people around, in, in fighting turnover, and you know, doing everything you can, uh, you know, to make sure that people are happy in the place that they are professionally, is is if you can work with the same team, if you can. If you can keep the same people around, keep that common goal, um, recognize that this person is extraordinarily talented. I've worked with I've worked with this person for a year, two years, three years. I know I know that they can execute on this. That's where you build trust. Right. You know, if you if you're fighting turnover and you're replacing half your staff every year, you don't trust doesn't come because because of an an empl- employment offer. You know, trust mm-hmm. comes, trust comes after that. Right. And, um, and I think, I think right now I do have a, I place a ton of trust in my staff to get their, to get their jobs done. Um, and I think that's a good place to be. It's a good place to be able to trust your staff to execute today. Right. I, today I'm, I'm in my basement right now and, and we've got staff <laughs> running the shop. I have no problem with that whatsoever. Right. Uh, I have no reason to believe otherwise. So I want to step back a little bit and talk about how you became involved with the organization um, and talk just a little bit about like what, what kind of pressure you were under when you assumed this role of executive director and where TEP was at that time versus to where it is now. So (laughs) ignorance is bliss, right? uh, (laughs) That's true. (laughs) <laughs> I, I came so when I when I came to the education partnership let's let's frame first where I was okay personally and professionally and then we'll frame where TEP was and I think that'll paint a better picture so personally 
I came to the education partnership in May of 2018. Okay. And I came to the education partnership from my role as co-director of another nonprofit that a friend and I had started back in 2012. Okay. So I, and prior to that, I was in the insurance world. So I went from insurance to a complete 180 career change to starting a nonprofit and learning, learning governance and learning, you know, nonprofit administration and learning fundraising, um, you know, learn, learning all those pieces. Mm -hmm. Six and a half years later, uh, I get a call from the education partnership saying from, from my predecessor and uh, the founder and executive director, Justin Brown, saying, hey, Josh, um, I'll cut right to the chase. I'm turning 65. Would you have any interest in, in applying to this role at the education partnership? And, and I, I had a little bit of hesitancy. Um, some of it stemmed from the fact that we were doing really well at Beverly's birthdays. You know, we all felt like we were on the up and up. Uh, and then the other hesitancy was I, I've only been in the nonprofit sector as a full-time career at that point for four and a half years. Mm -hmm. And, and I think imposter syndrome is a real thing. I think everyone has it. I don't think it's like a diagnosis. Well, it probably is, but, but I think everyone has it to a degree and you always right. question, you know, do I, do I really have the qualifications to be the, the CEO of, of what was then, uh, you know, a $5 million organization. Mm -hmm. What I had, the, the advantage I had was that um, I didn't, I wasn't looking for a job. I was happy with Beverly's birthdays. So I was able to be 100% transparent with, with the board of directors, with Justin, with, with my two, um, two other directors, Peggy and Jane at the organization. I was, I was able to be 100 I was able to be 100% transparent in the fact that this is what I am good at. This is what I know. This is what I've done at Beverly's birthdays. This is what I am not good at. If that fits what you're looking for, then I'd be happy to continue to pursue. If it's not what you're looking for, at least I've put my cards on the table and I'm setting appropriate expectations. Right. And I think that was an important conversation to have with the board. That was at, in Pitt, Ohio in, in their offices. I remember it and it was, maybe six board members were present and I was just like this is what I do this is what I've done this is what I'm good at right uh, so then fast forward May 2018 I accept the position and I started the education partnership and you know the, the organization's infrastructure in terms of the process that they've created for procurement of materials and then distribution is was flawless, I mean, not flawless, but it, but it was really strong, a really strong, efficient model to get school supplies back out to a network of schools mm -hmm. that had nothing in common other mm -hmm. than their, the, the uh, national school lunch program rate in their school. They were pr private schools, public schools. They crossed, they crossed districts and counties. It, it's a really cool thing. That's a cool connectivity to have. Right. Um, and they'd figured it out. You know, there was a good flow of incoming gift in kind product and in outgoing. I think what um, I think what the board saw uh, that I could do was that there were issues with kind of the internal structure and the internal kind of culture of of employee satisfaction mm -hmm. at TEP. You know, I. I didn't have the skill set to build this logistics operation. That's not my background. I'm not, I don't have a logistics background. I knew budgeting and I knew finance and I knew accounting so I could handle that piece of it. But then right. most of all was that, you know, the, the board thought that I, I was going to be able to have an effect on this internal culture of the organization. Mm -hmm. Or they never outwardly told me that. I'm, I'm <laughs> assuming that's part of it because it couldn't have been my technical skill that led me to the education partnership. Um, but coming into TEP, the most valuable tool that I had that, that was the most illuminating 
And for any future executive directors out there, upon taking a role, get those exit interviews from past employees. Single most beneficial thing that I had because there was some brutal honesty. And I think you have to take some of it with a grain of salt right. um, because of the potential circumstance behind that exit interview. But, but there's a lot of really good insight to be gained from that. Um, and they, I don't think they were monumental changes to be made, but things that just affected, you know, employee work-life balance and benefits and what, what tools do we have at the education partnership? You know, what mm -hmm. tools do we have as a nonprofit sector? Um, because unfortunately right now our salary equivalent to the for-profit sector is not an even plane. So what else can we do? How do we, how do we make sure that we can keep people happy, employed, gainfully employed? Um, yeah. you know, those, those are the questions that I, that I work on. Yeah. So, I mean, it's kind of like re relating back to football, right? It's like, you know, there's the team around you and as long as everybody's buying in, to themselves and also what the goal is, right? And as long as you create an environment in which everybody feels like they are being supported and you know have like the, that cheerleading section on the most, and as long as they feel like what they're bringing to the team is important, I think is what's good in terms of building an environment in which everybody can then cohesively work together. Yeah, and, and you know what? That's, that's it's really insightful. And we're not there yet. TEP isn't there yet. I think we've done a better job in, mm -hmm. in the past year and a half on getting to it. The way I, I look at that piece, uh, Mike, is like it, part of it is communication and, mm -hmm. and how open are your communication channels that people feel free to share recommendations. Because I think if you, if you turn a, a deaf ear to an idea or a concept too many times, eventually that mouth isn't going to tell you anything else. Right. Um, but at the same time, you can't act on every idea that comes your way. That, that's just not sustainable. Right. Um, so it, it's this balance of, of communication, open communication, encouraging thought, encouraging and innovation. So the communication is one piece of that. And then the other piece is recognition. Mm -hmm. and, and how do you recognize people for different things so that not only do they feel support, well, I guess it is so that they feel supported in that, in that their work is meaningful and beneficial to the company and working towards the goals. How do you recognize those people? And um, th there is no silver bullet. You know, there, there's every different type of personality in the world. Some people, you know, like to be thanked publicly. Some people like to be thanked privately. Some people need a pat on the back. Some people like group recognition and never mention them individually. Some people like uh, financial they come to work for a paycheck. They just, you know, uh, every, everyone's different. And I think trying, trying to understand how to make every, every person feel supported in their role, that communication is open, that their ideas are heard, that they're recognized for those ideas. Those are all key pieces of that, that, su that supportive, um, you know, lead from behind structure. Mm -hmm. So what do you do to like, basically get to know, like, if let's just say like, I've like I'm coming in, you don't know me, and I'm coming in for an interview, right? And let's say I get the job. What do you, what in terms of the interviewing process and then following up afterwards, what do you do then to assess and to keep reevaluating the person and trying to figure out, you know, what their strengths are, what their weaknesses are, and, you know, how they like to be celebrated or recognized? And then what do you do with that information with yourself? Hmm. That's a really good question. So we have, no, we haven't gone through it in a little while, but we have a 30 day, 90 day, six month evaluation. Mm -hmm. um, we haven't had any of those in a while. In fact, I would say that the structure of the organization, the way we evaluate one another has actually transformed since the last true onboarding of somebody. Um, and, and even in that, in those 30, 60, 90 days, I don't know if we outwardly ask the question, how do you like to be recognized? You know, I don't know if that's one of the things that we talk about. Yeah. Um, 
But what we do talk about a lot is that every year we do a team staff retreat. Um, it was something that we started in last year in 2019. And I think it helped a lot at getting to some of the pain points of, of the education partnership. And one of the things that came out of that was recognition. It was this recognition piece and how, how people, people talking about, oh no, I, I actually don't like the way that we're doing this, or this feels weird, or can it be anonymous, or is there some other way? So, you know, we didn't talk about it at higher, and maybe we should, you know, maybe we should, that should be on the end. Job offer acceptance. What's your, you know, what's your love <laughs> language? Is it uh, acts of service, uh, words of encouragement? You know, there's the four right. love languages. Maybe we should do that. <laughs> um, so, but we're constantly talking to each other about, about recognition. What is it that motivates you? You know, this staff retreat leading into it is an employee engagement survey. Mm -hmm. And it asks all sorts of questions about, um, do you understand the mission of the organization? Uh, would you recommend the organization to a friend? Uh, do, does the organization act upon its corporate values? Does the organization uh, support me and my family through work-life balance? You know, so it asks all these questions and you get data. You get data points back that you can measure as an organization, okay, you know, we did good in living our values. We still need to work on communication a bit and employee satisfaction is way up. So let, you know, it's like stop, start, continue. It gives you a pulse on, whoa, we need to pump the brakes on meetings. Right. And we need to tune up the, the work-life balance. So, you know, you can adjust on that. And I think that's been a good tool over the last two years to kind of set the stage of, we all agreed as an organization, these were the things that we're good at. These are the things that we're bad at. And if we're going to improve this year, here's some things that we can do. Um, and one of, you know, one of those pieces is recognition. Maybe we so, should start doing it earlier. <laughs> So you talked about basically um, a little bit about how like re-evaluating yourselves basically on a, and it, uh, at the end of a year almost, right? Like given like this like yearly checkup. So how would you then evaluate, how are you going to evaluate yourself and your team at the end of this year when there's been so many obstacles placed in your way, especially the fact that you're dealing with education and just like the amount of uncertainty there was and there still is in this school year, um, even now and then moving forward, how would you, how are you going to evaluate yourselves at the end of this year? You know, we talk about that exact same thing as a team. And we know that 2020 is going to be this outlier of a year in a lot of different areas, in, in areas of, you know, programmatic output or uh, in areas of financial contributions or uh, team you know, uh, infra infrastructure spending, mm -hmm. you know, it's going to look different. So when we set our goals every year, you know, we try and make them measurable, attainable, and, and accountable and things that we can go back and improve upon. This year, you know, it, it historically last year, you know, we said we want to deploy $6 million. We want to deploy $6 million worth of school supplies. Mm -hmm. Is that the right goal for this year? Do we even know if that's attainable? You know, we shopping is all different and, uh, and, and we now have online orders and some teachers don't show up because of precaution and, you know, there's all these variables. Right. So what is, what is our, what's our barometer for this year? How do you measure success this year? And what we decided, what I think is, is the right answer is what, what do our constituents say? to us at the end of the year. You know, uh, mm -hmm. last year we had a 97% approval rating from our constituents. Um, if, that, if that were to go down, the question would be, why did it go down? Did it go down because of COVID? And people just said, well, I couldn't get there because there was this pandemic. Right. Or did people say that service went down because we stopped doing something, we stopped becoming accessible, uh, we stopped uh, being able to deliver upon a promise of providing an X number of school supplies. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's that end 
client satisfaction. That's, that's the one metric that is going to be somewhat consistent this year. So I'm really curious to see how our year end, you know, data points come back in terms of teachers. How did, how did this affect you? How did this support you? Mm -hmm. Teachers, how did you see this affect your students? You know, did creativity drop, self-esteem drop? Uh, did, did uh, our ability to support you in daily classroom activities drop? You know, and those are the, right. those are the pieces of info that say, okay, if, if learning is going to be remote, then classroom supplies don't make sense. We need to, we need to come up with individual student supplies in total. Mm -hmm. um, but we're not there yet. You know, learning is, learning is hybrid and learning is hopefully going to go back to in classroom here soon. So hurry up and wait. Mike. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what are, what are the goals then uh, for like these next three to five years and what priorities will you help? Like how will you help like achieve them and what barriers do you think are in your way? In the next three to five years, well, you know, we're in a, um, we're in a strategic plan right now and we're about to come to the conclusion of our next mm -hmm. three year strategic plan. And it, it talks a lot about financial sustainability and it talks about board succession and it talks about uh, programmatic impact. I think where I see, you know, what do we, what do we want to accomplish as the education partnership in the next three to five years? I think anyone on our board and on our staff would say, we want to meet more of the need. So we want to grow in that sense of you know, right now we serve 143 schools. Three years down the road, let's see if we can get to 180 schools or whatever that number ends up being. You know, mm -hmm. we want to see growth in just our footprint of who we're affecting. I think we also want to see as education changes, how can we, how can we deepen our impact at the same time? So it's this question of breadth and depth of service. So breadth is we want to get to more schools. Depth is if, if schools now need technology, computers, internet access, how do we do that? If right. classroom sizes grow and now every teacher needs, you know, 10 sets of markers instead of eight sets of markers, how do we grow? How do we grow depth of impact too? Mm -hmm. So I think over the, the next three to five years, we need to grow in that way. But if we're really going to be successful as an organization, as we grow externally, we need to grow internally. You need to work on the infrastructure of your organization. And that's, that's one of the parts of the strategic plan as well, is that how can we create a structure that continues to be scalable and also gives the, the people working at the education partnership the chance to advance within that, that, own organ, that organization. Right. Um, you know, economics, economics 101 is grow or die. And I think there's... I'm not a full believer, but there's a lot of truth to it in the yeah. sense that if you don't grow, if you don't grow your organization, then you're likely not going to be able to grow your people. And if people cannot feel like they are growing, they are going to go somewhere else. People have to grow. Right. Uh, so in the next three to five years, I'd love to see, I'd love to see the programmatic impact increase by 30%, 40%. You know, I don't know what that looks like. We're in a pandemic, but let's grow that impact. And at the same time, you're not going to be able to grow that without human capacity. So let's thoughtfully add human capacity and create, create a structure for people to, to continue to improve their skills. Right. So what would you say then is the best kept secret of TEP, either a service that you offer or even just like, you know, through the individuals that you have in your office, what do you think is the best kept secret that you guys have? Wow. What a question. So whenever you said the best kept secret of a service that you offer, mm -hmm. I think um, one thing that we're discussing as a staff right now is our, uh, we call it, it used to be called corporate mobilization. Now it's called external purchasing. Mm -hmm. it's, it's we can buy. We can buy for other organizations seeking school supplies as long as they're serving our constituent base. Right. As long as they're serving at-risk youth, um, we can do those purchases and we can buy very inexpensively. You know, we can get discounts down to the pennies on a dollar. Um, so I, I think that's one thing that grew a lot during the pandemic was that we became this 
community procurement organization and we were able to get out you know goods to an extra 20,000 kids over the course of the summer through external purchasing mm -hmm. and leveraging other people's networks to support low income youth. So I would say external purchasing is a, is a is a well kept secret at TEP, something we're trying to thoughtfully un secretize. <laughs> but yet you, but we have to do it in a very uh, tactful way, in a very right. strategic way, uh, to make sure that you're still this mutually beneficial community supporting nonprofit organization. Mm -hmm. um, and then the best kept secret about our staff, like internally, I don't know if it's a secret, but it, I think we're all really good people. Yeah. Like, I think generally every, every person on staff at the education partnership, you can walk up to and you can have a conversation with, um, you know, I think we're just a team of really good approachable people who, who are in the work for the right reason. No, I would agree. Um, for the audience that doesn't know, I am actually on my second internship with TEP. And the reason I did come back was this sense of just openness and like great just teamwork and like collaborative spirit that I that I gained and honestly kind of like propelled me to be a little bit outside of myself, especially like comparing myself from last year's internship to this year's internship. Maybe it's just because I'm I know you guys better now on a more personal level, but I think just in terms of the environment that you create for people walking in the building, I think is just as important as the environment that you create for your team to work in as well. Well, thanks. You know, officially for our listeners, Mike is our executive intern. <laughs> Let's make sure we get our uh, vernacular right here. <laughs> executive intern, Mike Bernice. And, uh, and yeah, Mike, we try and make everyone you know, visitors that come into the office to kind of feel that, that warmth of mission, mm -hmm. because, you know, we're a nonprofit, we're a fundraising organization. And, and is somebody going to want to be associated with a community organization that doesn't feel like the message that they're putting out mm -hmm. to the community, or that doesn't feel like they're, they're doing the mission because they, they want to do it. No, right. no, people want to be invested in, in something that, other people are invested in. So I think um, we, ha we have made it a point to make sure that when someone comes into the organization, they feel, they feel at home. I mean, when you walk into TEP, you walk into our kitchen. You walk into <laughs> kitchen and then the kitchen, and you're always, I guarantee you, you walk in, they're going to say, do you want anything to eat? Do you want a cup of coffee? Right. And I think, you know, <laughs> people say no, but, but that's not important. Asking is important. Right. No, I, it's, it is, uh, it's a very cool dynamic that we have there. And I think like one of my favorite spots is like the little like coffee shop type area that we have set up on the teacher resource center. I just think that's a, just a cool place to just like go out there and just like kind of have like some like alone space to yourself, but it's just so, I don't know, just like the, the environment, like I said, just going back to the environment that you've created is an environment that just feels homey. And you know, like you said, it's important for somebody that's especially dealing with education and how rooted it is in a community. I think it's very important that you build your own sense of community for them to welcome people in. And I think that's how then you go back to growing your organization is how you grow it is by saying we are for the community. We have our community come join us. Hmm. I like that way of thinking of it. I like the way they go. We are our, our own little community. We, we right. have our own little thing. That coffee shop is cool. I, you know, I feel like during COVID, the coffee shop hasn't gotten nearly. I mean, you can't, you can't. Yeah. You know, but that is usually uh, chess battlegrounds is, you know, Crystal's Cafe is right in our shopping center. Mm -hmm. And there's a, a glass chess board in there that you can usually find staff duking it out on. <laughs> so, what would you say is the hardest decision the organization has had to make recently and how did you evaluate the trade-offs involved? Hmm. The hardest decision the organization has had to make recently. Uh, I don't know if it was hard. 
Yeah, I guess it was. I mean, if I, I had to think about it for a while, but you know, when COVID hit back March, April, May, um, we, we did our budget. We did our budget May 1st mm -hmm. is when our fiscal year starts. Okay. And that's a month after COVID. I mean, that was stock market had just tanked, you know, all of your fundraising events were now canceled. Um, the, everyone was putting their funding towards uh, first responders. Everyone was putting their money towards food relief. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you had just, de just developed a budget. And within a month, you took a look at it and you said, we lost a quarter million dollars. That at that time, I had a decision to make, you know, a lot of organizations, for-profit and nonprofit, but a lot of nonprofits had to go the route of furloughing and laying people off. Mm -hmm. TEP, you know, that thought maybe crossed my mind for a moment, a, a few moments, <laughs> but, but overwhelmingly, you know, what we brought to the community as an organization was that I knew we were going to be one of those essential organizations mm -hmm. that had to stay open to support um, both first responders and then, and then the huge crash of education need uh, immediately following that. Um, so we made the decision to double down on staff, not lay anybody off, you know, figure out what were those what were those jobs that we could do as an organization and, and try and figure out the, the finance piece, you know, as, as time continued to unfold. But I think that decision of, okay, March, March 16th, um, the country shut down. Everyone had a decision. You can phone in 2020 and you can say, you know what, we're going to lay low. We're just gonna we're gonna shut her up and we're gonna ride out this storm, or you can say, "Nope, 2020's here and we we have a job to do and we're gonna figure out we're gonna figure out ways of of working through this, mm -hmm. regardless of how painful that might be." Right. And we decided to do to do the latter, and and I can I can look at you today and say I think the Education Partnership is a much stronger organization, October 9th, 2020, than we were March 16th, 2020. Yeah. Like, what have you, what have you learned about yourself and about your team and about the organization as a whole through this whole year so far? Um, that, you know, re resiliency, grit <laughs> is a real thing. Uh, I think having a, having a solution oriented mindset. Um, it is extraordinarily valuable whenever you're working through times of, of crisis. Mm -hmm. um, and, and what we learned as a team is that I think we can do, we can do a lot. And, and I think we, and I don't only mean us personally within our own bubbles, we each can do a lot. I think right. as, as an organization, the education partnership mm -hmm. can do a lot for this community. You know, we can do a lot more than just, um, you know, run, run a teacher shopping center in the mm -hmm. West End. We can support, we can support entire bodies of, of communities through, through our various partnerships. Um, and I think that was important for us to learn as an organization that we, we, we are who we say we are. Do you think it was almost as a, like kind of like a wake up call then for the community to be like, hey, like we are here and we are still able to help as, you know, maybe some other people aren't, aren't around anymore? Well, I don't know if that, I think of it because other people aren't around anymore. I don't think mm -hmm. that that's the um, prevailing concept. I think what is, what I do think about is awareness of the education partnership. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think today, um, be, because of the role that we played in, in different collaborations over the summer, in different partnerships over the summer, in being this community procurement for a dozen 
uh, you know, significant organizations, I think those things are all small things that cumulatively add up to this, um, this recognition, this awareness mm -hmm. you know, within Pittsburgh. And I think Pittsburgh is a, is a really cool city to be able to do something like that. You know, right. Pittsburgh, every, Pittsburgh's small and everyone knows everyone. Um, you don't have to move mountains to, to have an impact. And I think, I think the education partnership did elevate, did elevate our, um, our ability to perform within the community. Do you see your role maybe a changing or adapting as like the years move on, maybe adopting this community procurement role to a bigger extent than what you utilized it for this year? Uh, I mean, I think that's possible, but mm -hmm. you know, at the end of the day, our mission is to uh, get, get school supplies and resources to under-resourced schools and until they have everything that they need for every student to have a meaningful education. Uh, until that happens, no, I don't see our role in the community changing. I mean, that's what it means to be a nonprofit is you have this mission statement and you stick to it. Mm -hmm. if, our, if our role would change in order to do that more effectively, then, then maybe, but um, no, I, th there's so much need in the community, Mike, that, that I don't see our role, I don't see our role being able to change and, and, and less government and education funding would, you know, double right. or triple and actually fill the need equitably. No, I don't see our role changing. So where, where then do you lie in terms of like, basically where do you, where do you like to spend like your personal time at with TEP? Like where do you feel you are best utilized for the organization now and then also moving forward? Where am I best utilized? I don't know. I, don't know. Uh, I think I bring a good, I, I try and bring a good um, even keel perspective mm -hmm. to, to the various dynamics at the education partnership. You know, like I said, the, the, the organization has an has a extremely efficient model for accomplishing, for accomplishing our work. You know what? What I bring to the table is recognizing, recognizing opportunities to do it better or to do it in a way uh, that that makes people happier, either on the constituent side or on the or on the back end side uh, internally. Uh, I think I'm best utilized to continue to push push the envelope in a number of arenas. I'm not one to sit still. Um, in any area. So I will always say there's 250 schools in southwestern Pennsylvania we could be serving. Mm -hmm. We're not going to stop until until we get there. At the same time I say you know uh, non nonprofit employees should not be uh, doomed to a life of of servitude. Uh, you know you, you people great people should be compensated greatly to do great work. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think I want to push the envelope on what it means to be a nonprofit entity, uh, and I think I play the role of challenging, challenging board staff and kind of internal structure to to think that way and to not get comfortable or complacent. Yeah, well, I think that's like one thing that has definitely been shown is this: like when you have a tendency to be complacent, is oftentimes when things can be overlooked and when you can start slipping as an organization right because you were in the beginning you were talking about how it's just important to grow and to promote growth because if you're not growing you're dying right so this complacency factor in which where you feel like you've kind of reached your goals and then it's almost like okay you're in a like reevaluation stage where it's like okay now what's next you know it's like it's important to focus on where you are right now and in the moment and what you're trying to accomplish but it's also, in my opinion, important to focus on the future and what you're trying to build now so that that way, when three years comes, you can look back and say, okay, we accomplished this, 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 and this. Here's the areas in which we lie. Let's then set these goals to then bring that back up, right? Because you want to be, as most, you don't want to have like 
spikes and dips within your organization, you want to generally have everything can not complacent. What's the word I'm looking for? Comparable, comparable, I guess. We'll go I think that congruent. makes sense. I think congruent, maybe, <laughs> <laughs> but you get what I'm saying. You want to have a nice balance in across all levels instead of, you know, like marketing has is great. We're in terms of, you know, sales is down, you know what I mean? Oh yeah. I think having a pulse on, having a pulse on your budget. I mean, that's what budgeting is about. Budgeting mm -hmm. is making sure that things don't get out of whack, so to speak. Yeah. Um, yeah. And making sure everything is growing together in the right way. Maybe the, an easy way to say it. All right. So the last question I have for you then is for TEP to stay as effective and then to grow as effectiveness, where would you like to see it? Hmm. To stay as effective and to grow as effectively. Uh, so I think, I think having resources to do it is, is paramount. So, you know, first and foremost, I think we need to make sure that education education funding, both from a um, state and federal level, but also as, as a nonprofit charitable entity, mm -hmm. that education um, continues to be on the forefront of um, funding priorities. You know, uh, now I'm biased, but you know, education is, is one, of those, one of those things that can drastically impact and alter the trajectory of somebody's life for the better, you know? <clears throat> mm -hmm. um, so I think I'd like to see education remain important. Um, and then was there a second part to your question? Yeah, just like basically how do you keep like this environment which you've already built, how do you keep building upon it and making sure that it doesn't like stay stagnant? Well, uh, I think you need to constantly be th thinking about, like what you said, thinking about the future, thinking about, okay, if X, then Y, and at what point do I need to implement change? So I mm -hmm. think having a pulse on what is your growth like? What is your shrinkage like? Um, and maintaining a pulse on what are those most important things to the organization at any given time. Uh, and then it always comes down to people. It always comes down to, to the people at the organization, the people actually doing the work. Um, and if you can maintain a culture of fulfillment, um, a, a place where people feel like they are uh, properly recognized and rewarded for the work that they're doing and they feel like they are contributing and growing themselves, mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's what it's going to take. That's what it's going to take is, is to grow the organization in, in all those, in all those important ways. Well, Josh, I thank you so much for stopping by the stoop today. You know, we'll definitely have to get on, get a hold of Pat McAfee for this like kickoff event. <laughs> You know, let's, 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 I mean, I'll shoot him a message. I'll shoot him a message <laughs> on Instagram. See, see if he uh, responds. Have you, you have, coming home for Thanksgiving or something? Would you, uh, would you, would you say you need some time to warm up and to like relearn your steps or are you constantly practicing? Well, I just, I have to test out my hip. I, I injured my hip flexor in, well, I like tweaked it playing indoor soccer maybe two years ago. And then a year before that, I like seriously heard it uh, coaching. So I got to test out the hip, but if the hip's okay. fine, it, it's like riding a bike, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> Just get ready to hop right back in the saddle. Oh, hundred <laughs> percent. Well, Josh, again, thank you for stopping by the stoop. Uh, please uh, do yourself a favor and give TEP and yourself a shout out. That way people know where to find you TEP and to stay up to date on everything that you guys do. Yeah. You can check us out online theeducationpartnership.org. Uh, the website's got more information than you need, but laid out really nice, theeducationpartnership.org. Uh, or you can find us on Facebook for up to the 
the minute updates on what we're doing. And that's facebook.com slash the education partnership. Sounds good, Josh. And to all of our listeners who tuned in today, please make sure to use the um, discount code Steep Legends for Follow the Trees, Drive the Vibe discounts on all their CBD products. And then make sure to tune in to our website at www.legendsofthestoop.com to stay up to date on all of our most recent podcast episodes and the services that we do provide. Again, this is Josh Whiteside from the Education Partnership. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Mike. We We're the, the legends, legends of the stoop. stoop. We're here to advocate, stoop. educate, and inspire society. Stoop. Coming at you live from the south side. Make sure to tune into our website at www.legendsofthestoop.com. Use the hashtag on all social platforms. Stoop. Hashtag Stoop <laughs> Legends We the legends of the Stoop Coming at you live Right here in Southside www.legendsofthestoop.com <laughs>